slave. I say, prayed on no longer. I've heard enough of your talking. All you are is a woman's slave. Haman says, Dost thou wish to speak, and speaking wilt not listen? Is it so? You're the only one that gets to talk. Why is it you're the only one that gets to talk? Why can't anyone else talk? You, all alone, Creon says, No, by Olympus, thou shalt not go free to flout me with reproaches. Lead her out, whom my soul hates, that she may die forthwith before mine eyes and hear her bridegroom here. And in other words, bring out Antigone, he says. At this point, Creon's completely lost it. He says, you know what? I'm going to kill her right here and now in front of my son just so we can watch his bride to be killed. Whoa. Haman, these are his last words. No, he says, no, think it not. Near me she shall not die, and thou shalt never see my face alive. So mad art thou with all that would be friends. And he leaves. And that's it. Haman says to his dad, you're an idiot. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna watch this happen. This is this is uh, this is terrible, terrible. And he leaves. The chorus says, The man is gone, O king, in hasty mood. A mind Many adults have read this, this, uh, this line as, as being clearly a powerful one. A mind distressed in youth is hard to bear. We think of Hamlet, don't we, in Act 1, right? But break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. The chorus says, you upset him, and he's clearly very, very upset. You better think through this whole thing. So notice Creon now. He's got a lot of spinning plates that he's dealing with. He's got, of course, this thing about the law and how you keep the law once it's broken. But now he's got this thing about his, about his son. His son has said, if you go forward with this, I'm, I, I, I will die. To what degree, then, is Creon willing to go through with this? I think that this exchange is the heart of the play, which is why I've taken so much time with it with you. It really is that we see Creon here now finally as protagonist in the way that Aristotle would define protagonist. Why? Because Greek audiences are going to identify powerfully, right? Notice, because of the Greek audiences and their patriarchal view, men are more powerful and more, and more important than women. The state is more important than the individual. Notice, though, how we, as pre-modern viewers of this scene, see it quite differently. Many of my students just see Creon as a total jerk, at least until I try and help them to see, no, I don't think so. I think it's wrong to just see it as simple. I, again, they, they're not clear lines here. Creon is not just a jerk. Creon is in a powerful situation by virtue of power and authority. He's made a rule. Now the rule's been broken. Now he's going to say, I've got to keep my rule. I've got I've to do the punishment. And the young son says, yeah, no, Dad, that's a stupid thing to do. It is hard for parents to hear children say to them, you're wrong. Think about the last time, 3B question, think about the last time you did that. Think about the last time, and here's the deal, for all of us that have been parents, sooner or later, we will be wrong. Every parent knows that, by the way. I know that might shock some of you and you're smiling, but it's true. Every parent knows they screwed up. Every parent knows he or she has screwed up. But what happens when the child or the young person says you screwed up? How do you respond to that? Right? What I'm trying to do here is to help you see this from both sides and to appreciate the conflict from both sides. Right? Um, it's at this point now that the play actually ends quickly. Once Haman leaves, this play is over. We all pretty much know what's about to happen here. It's the way in which it happens that's going to be the brilliance for us. The chorus with Creon will make the agreement, no death to Ismene, Creon is going to show some mercy here, and instead of stoning Antigone, he's just simply going to put her inside of a cave and bury her alive with a little bit of food, as if somehow that's more merciful, right? Antigone will come on stage to speak her final words, and she's a different character. Let's put this in our notes. When we see Antigone for the last time, she is not the same Antigone that we saw earlier in the play. She rather has come to realize that what she has chosen to do has implications, namely her death. She will say things like, unwept, without a friend, unwed, and whelmed in woe. The word woe gets used again and again and again. I journey on the road that open lies. No more shall it be mine. And then she says it, oh, misery. A little bit later, she'll again use the word, 
misery, which is why Matthew Arnold in his classic poem, Dover Beach, when he's talking about Sophocles, Sophocles heard it long ago in the Aegean and it brought to him the turbid ebb and flow of human misery, he uses the very word misery here. Go back and look at that lecture that I have posted on LarnStrong.net, uh, Matthew Arnold's classic Dover Beach. In other words, life is miserable. She recognizes, oh, misery. To look upon the holy eye of day, and yet of all my friends, no one bewells my fate, no kindly tear is shed. Antigone, almost speaking for Sophocles, to his Greek audience says, I know I named this play Antigone, but I also am aware, Sophocles seems to be saying, you can't cry for her, can you? Because you understand that if you're going to cry for anybody, you're going to cry for Creon. Because Creon is the one that's stuck in the middle of a nasty situation, and Antigone is going off to her death. She continues to bewail, bereaved of friends and utter misery, she will say one more time. She says it for holiest deed, I bear this charge of rank unholiness. To the end, she claims that what she did was right and just. If acts like these the gods on high approve, we, taught by suffering, own that we have sinned. But if they sin, looking at Creon, I pray they suffer worse evils than the wrongs they do to me. In other words, she says it. Creon, I hope you suffer even worse than I suffer. And of course, Creon at the end of this play will know the suffering that will come from too late reversing his decision. Well, the play, as we say now, will very, very culminate. Let's go quickly now to the end of the play to get to level two and three. Tiresias shows up. The same Tiresias that we saw in the, in, in the uh, play Oedipus the King, and we had some comments already about the origination of Tiresias. Go back and listen to that lecture to remember. But we will just say, Tiresias blind, but he knows the future. And he comes in, and he basically says, look, bird guts tell me a lot, and you're in trouble. You are seriously jacked. Um, he's accused by Creon of being paid off. And in fact... <laughs> Um, the way he says it, Tiresias says, um, you walk upon a razor's edge, is what he says, right? And Creon will come back and he will accuse Tiresias of being paid off. Somebody is paying you off to say this to me. And, um, and he says, the race of seers is ever fond of gold. It almost seems as if Sophocles is answering the question about the oracle at Delphi or any other oracle, that when you went to the oracle at Delphi, you sometimes brought money or whatever. And, it's, and it seems like maybe in Athenian society, people were beginning to suggest, you know, this religion thing is kind of a racket. Somebody's making a serious amount of money here. Creon echoes that idea, and Tiresias hits him between the eyes. Tiresias says, you will pay for your pride. You will pay for your stubbornness. This is going to be the end of you. You better get to the burial of Polynices and then you better let that girl out of her cave so she doesn't die. Creon, after Tiresias leaves, is at first unwilling to hear anything that is uh, being suggested. It will be the chorus who says it. Does, uh, the chorus says... Go thou first. Uh, Creon asks the chorus after Tiresias leaves, What then should I do? Tell me, and I will hearken. And the chorus says, Go thou first. Release the maiden from her cavern tomb and give a grave to him who lies exposed. It's ironic. Darkly, darkly ironic. And this is where Shakespeare, I mean, the birth of Shakespearean irony and tragedy is born in plays like this. Watch this. The chorus says, This is very simple. You made a mistake. Go and free Antigone, and then go bury the body of Polynices. The suggestion might even be, take Antigone with you, properly bury the body of Polynices, and that will be enough to appease the rage of Antigone, and of course, Haman as well. That is, in fact, not the order that Creon goes in. Creon will, in fact, say back to the audience, is this your counsel? Do you bid me to yield? In other words, this is what I'm supposed to do, just give way. The chorus says, yeah, without delay, O king. They come, the gods, swift-footed ministers of ill, and in an instant lay the wicked low. Creon says, oh me, it's hard. And yet, he says, I bend my will to do thy bidding. With necessity, we must not fight at such overwhelming odds. Go then, the chorus says, and act. Commit it not to others. Creon says, 
Even as I am, I'll go. Come, come, he says to my men. Present her absent. Come, and in your hands bring axes. Come to yonder eminence, and I, since now my judgment learns that way. Again, the word learning gets used here. Who myself bound her, now myself will loose. Too much I fear, lest it should pr uh, wise prove to end my life maintaining ancient laws. In other words, he says, it. okay, 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 I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. Ironically, a messenger comes on stage to tell us that's not the order. First he went to bury the body of Polynices, giving Haman enough time to go to the cave of Antigone. He's going to free his girl. But when, Han when Haman gets there, Antigone has already hang hanged herself. She has a cord uh, and she's hanged herself, much like her mother, Jacusta, and it's too late. The messenger tells us, none of this we see, the messenger tells us that when Creon arrived at the, gate, at the cave, he hears his son's wailing voice. When he goes in, his son tries to kill his own father. When he realizes he can't kill Creon, he falls on his own sword, he kills himself. We think, of course, at the end of Romeo and Juliet, that the lover is willing, like Pyramus Thisbe from our Ovid Metamorphoses, we have, of course, again this idea that if I cannot live with my, with my lover, then I will die. The son kills himself. And when we finally see Creon at the end of this play, he walks on stage, the body of his son brought on stage. As the messenger has been talking, Eurydice, the mother of Haman, the wife of Creon, will come on. She will hear that her son is dead. She will leave. And we're told that she goes off to kill herself. At the end of the play, we have Creon then. Now he's ready to speak. The chorus says, Too late thou seemest to see the right. And Creon will say, Ah me, I learn the grievous lesson. On my head, God, pressing sore, has smitten me and vexed in ways most rough and terrible. Ah oh, me, shattering the joy and trampling underfoot. Woe, woe. A, 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 a word that we see again and again uh, in, in uh, Sophocles. We toil for that which profits not. And then when he sees the dead body of his wife, Eurydice, he says, woe is me, the second stroke I gaze on, miserable, what fate, ye that still lies in wait for me. Here in my arms I bear what was my son, and there, oh, misery. Again, we're back to the word misery. Look upon the dead, ah, oh, wretched mother, ah, oh, my son, my son. He says, woe, woe, alas, I shudder in my fear. Will no one strike a deadly blow with sharp two-edged sword? Will somebody just kill me? Fearful my fate, alas, and with a fearful woe, full sore beset. The second messenger will in fact tell Creon that in death, Eurydice charged her husband for all of their sorrows, his and her alike. Creon says, and in what way struck she the murderous blow? And the second messenger said, her hand below her heart, she stabbed hearing her son's most pitiful fate. Creon says, Ah, oh, me. And then Creon says it. The fault is mine. On no one else of all that live the fearful guilt can come. I, even I, did slay thee, wretched one. I, yes, I say it clearly. Come, ye guards, lead me forth quickly, sounding very much like Oedipus at the end of Oedipus Rex. Lead me out of sight. The word sight, of course, is powerful to be used. More crushed to nothing than the dead unborn. The chorus will then say, Thou counselest gain, if gain there be in ills. Can you learn anything from evil? This has always been one of the oft-contested questions about Sophocles. Does he believe that pain and suffering is a propedeutic, that you can actually learn something from it? Or, rather, is Sophocles' view that, hey, stuff happens, bad stuff happens, it's just the way it is, and you've got to just learn to live with it, right? Thou counselest gain if gain there be in ills, for present evils then are easiest born when shortest lived. This seems to suggest for the Chorus that, you know what, there isn't a lot to be learned from pain and suffering, you just got to get through it. Creon says, O come thou then, come thou last of my sorrows, that shall bring to me best boon my life's last day. There seems to be some suggestion that Creon's going to go off to die. Come then, O come 
that never more I look upon the light. There seems to be some suggestion of possible suicide coming here. Chorus says, these things are in the future. What is near, that we must do. Or what is yet to come, they watch. To whom that work of right belongs. Creon says, I did but pray for what I most desire. And the chorus says, pray thou for nothing more. For mortal man, there is no issue from a doom decreed. In other words, there's no way to escape your doom. Creon looking at the two corpses of his son, of course, and, and, uh, and, and Eurydice. Lead me then forth, vain shadow that I am. Uh, Shakespeare, of course, in his famous Tomorrow and Tomorrow, Tomorrow speech in Macbeth will, in fact, in 5-2, say that life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets her hour upon the stage, his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. The vain shadow that I am who slew thee, O my son, unwittingly, and thee too, O my sorrow, and I know not which way to look. The fact that he says, I know not, is powerful. I don't know where to look. Everywhere I look, there's, there's death, and I'm responsible for it. All near at hand is turned aside to evil, and upon my head there falls a doom far worse than I can bear. The chorus says, man's highest blessedness. Now, just like at the end of Oedipus the King, we have now the chorus giving the final message. What is the final message from a really tragic play like this? Man's final highest blessedness in wisdom chiefly stands. And in the things that touch upon the gods, tis best in word or deed to shun unholy pride. We think of hubris, right, in Aristotle's poetics. Great words of boasting bring great punishments. And so to gray-haired age comes wisdom at the last, the final word of this play is the word last. In other words, we learn wisdom, but we often learn it too late, late in our life. Well, there's the play. Let's work now levels two and three. At 2A, messages and themes quickly. Well, obviously, one is that choices have consequences, right? Antigone, for example, makes choices that have consequences for Ismene, for Haman. Of course, Creon has choices that have consequences for Haman, for his wife, and of course for himself. Think about another major message, private intent versus public good, right? This is a tough tension. Um, think about, for example, what we've said about John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, and the whole idea about what happens when the will of the individual comes into contact and conflict with the will of the group or the state, and how do you balance those two things, right? Finally, sooner or later, we all end up playing, think about this, we all end up playing all of these different roles. I think this is one of the reasons why this play becomes such a genius play for so many generations. Because in our own way, we'll say more about this here in a bit at 3B, all of us have played the role of Antigone, right? That person who had to do something against the, against the, the authority figure, even though we knew it would probably end up jacking us. All of us have played the role of Creon, or we will, where we are the person in power and we have to make a rule, and then we have to live with what happens if the rule gets broken. All of us have been in the position of Haman, where we wanted to counsel, for example, someone who was older than us, to say, basically, you're wrong. You need to hear me out. And the adult figure goes, yeah, I got no interest in hearing you out. All of us have played or will play the role, the role of Eurydice that, or, or Ismene, the kind of innocent bystanders, the people who are collateral damage, those, those people in our lives who kind of end up getting jacked. There seems to be a suggestion then for Sophocles that this is what life is about. It's about somehow trying to live through all of that pain and suffering that is inevitably coming and find some sense of wisdom. And can it be done? At level 2B, rhetoric, not what is said, but how it's said. Well, we promised that we would talk about symbols. Let's mention some of those symbols. Obviously, the burial of Polynices, that burial, the act of burial, is a powerful symbol. It's the symbol that says, it's the act that says, I will not allow for tyranny to occur. Of course, it will lead to all the ripple effects of the play, doesn't it? Right? There's the powerful image of the state as being a boat and the leader as being its captain, and yet wrecked on the rocks comes to mind, right? Tiresias is a powerful symbol, the voice of wisdom, but only, it seems, heard too late. We think about the famous mythic story, right, of Daedalus Icarus, the son who's told by the father, Daedalus, don't fly too close to the sun. And it's only when Icarus is falling out of the sky because the wax melted off of his wings that the young man realizes he should have listened. Right? 
We mentioned conflicts as being central to our study of this. All kinds. I mean, think about all the conflicts. I'll only list a, list a few. You list the rest of them in your notes. We have, of course, the conflict of men versus women, right? Ismini, remember, at the beginning of the play says, we're women. We can't go against the will of men. And that's exactly what Antigone does. And the way in which the patriarchy is powerfully represented in this play. We have the conflict of young versus old and the ways in which old don't like to hear from the young, right? We think about um, uh, W.B. Yeats' sailing to Byzantium. That is no country for old men, the young in one another's arms. This is a, 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 what makes Yeats a modern poet. He already recognized that the young have overtaken the old. Back to the very last lines of uh, Aeschylus' Oresteia as well, where the young, beautiful gods of Athena and Apollo have overtaken the old gods, the Furies, the Eurydides, the Eumenides. Uh, we have the conflict of private versus public interests. We have the conflict of law versus choice, right? We have the conflict of Creon versus the God's will. Think about the narrative approach. Like the chorus, the audience members in this play are stuck on the horns of a nasty dilemma. You can understand why Creon is acting the way he acts. You can understand why Antigone and Haman act the way that they act. Arguments on both sides make sense, which is what makes, I think, this play the tragedy, even today, that it is. 3A, in relationship to other texts. Well, how about this one? What's up with all these Greek families and how jacked up they are? We think of the Oresteia, we think of this, right? Is there some point that's being made here about the tensions within families and the resolution of those tensions? Think about, as well, Prometheus Bound. Think about all of the Promethean characters. Oedipus, of course, is a very Promethean character. His daughter Antigone, a very Promethean character. Creon, very Promethean. Haman, very Promethean. All of them sharing common what? Don't tell me what to do. No, 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 no. I, I am right. You are right.